A History of the World in a Hundred Objects, from BBC Radio 4. Every day I walk through the Egyptian Sculpture Gallery at the British Museum, and every day there are tour guides speaking every imaginable language, addressing groups of visitors who are craning to see the object that I'll be talking about in this programme. It's on every visitor's itinerary, and with the mummies, it's the most popular object in the British Museum. Why? To look at, it is decidedly dull. It's a grey stone about the size of one of those large suitcases you see people trundling around on wheels at airports, and the rough edges show that it's been broken from a larger stone, with the fractures cutting across the text that covers one side. And when you read that text, it's pretty dull too. It's mostly bureaucratic jargon about tax concessions. But as so often in the museum, appearances are deceiving because this dreary bit of broken granite has played a starring role in three fascinating and different stories. The story of the Greek kings who ruled in Alexandria after Alexander the Great conquered Egypt. The story of the French and British imperial competition across the Middle East after Napoleon invaded Egypt, and the extraordinary but peaceful scholarly contest that led to the most famous decipherment in history, the cracking of hieroglyphics. In the Memphis Decree, we find a Greek view of the world in Egyptian terms. I think it's quite weird why you would put this sort of a statement, which is basically a statement of tax exemption, on such a heavy stone. I mean, 760 kilograms. Why did they do that? A history of the world in a hundred objects. The Rosetta Stone, erected in 196 BC, found at El Rashid, Egypt. This is a week of objects connected to shifting empires and legendary rulers, from Alexander the Great to the Emperor Augustus. Over 2,000 years ago, from the Mediterranean and the Middle East to India and China, these leaders found different ways of physically projecting their power and their authority. Today's programme is particularly fascinating, though, because it's a special case. It's about a ruler who's not strong, but weak. A king who has to bargain for and protect his power by borrowing the invincible strength of the gods, or, more precisely, the priests. We're in Egypt, with Ptolemy V, a Greek boy king who came to the throne as an orphan in 205 BC at the age of six. Ptolemy V was born into a great dynasty. The first Ptolemy was one of Alexander the Great's generals, who around a hundred years earlier had taken over Egypt following Alexander's death. The Ptolemies didn't trouble to learn Egyptian. They simply made all their officials speak Greek, and so Greek would be the language of state administration in Egypt for a thousand years. Perhaps their greatest achievement was to make their capital city, Alexandria, into the most brilliant metropolis of the Greek-speaking world. For centuries, it was second only to Rome. It was a cosmopolitan magnet for goods, people and ideas. The vast library of Alexandria was built by the Ptolemies. In it, they planned to collect all the world's knowledge. And Ptolemies I and II created the famous Pharos Lighthouse, which became one of the seven wonders of the world. Such a lively, diverse city needed strong leadership. When Ptolemy V's father died suddenly, leaving the boy as king, the dynasty and its control of Egypt looked fragile. The boy's mother was killed, the palace was torn by soldiers, and there were revolts throughout the country, which delayed the young Ptolemy's coronation for years. It was in these volatile circumstances that Ptolemy V issued the Rosetta Stone and others like it. The stone is not unique. There are another 17 similar inscriptions quite like it, all in three languages and all proclaiming the greatness of the Ptolemies. These were put up in major temple complexes across Egypt. The Rosetta Stone was made in 196 BC, on the first anniversary of the coronation of Ptolemy V, by then a teenager. It's a decree issued by Egyptian priests, 
ostensibly to mark the coronation and to declare Ptolemy's new status as a living god. Divinity went with the job of being a pharaoh. The priests had given Ptolemy a full Egyptian coronation at the sacred city of Memphis, and this greatly strengthened his position as the rightful ruler of Egypt. But there was a trade-off. Ptolemy may have become a god, but to get there, he'd had to negotiate some very unheavenly politics with his extremely powerful Egyptian priests. Dorothy Thompson, Emeritus Professor at Cambridge University, explains. The occasion which resulted in this decree was in some respects a change. There had been previous decrees and they take much the same form. But in this particular reign, the reign of a very young king whose kingdom was under attack from many quarters, one of the clauses of the Memphis decree, the Rosetta Stone, is that priests should no longer come every year to Alexandria. Alexandria was the new Greek capital. Instead, they could meet at Memphis, the old centre of Egypt. This was new, and it may be seen, perhaps, as a concession on the part of the royal household. The priests were critical in keeping the hearts and minds of the Egyptian masses on side for Ptolemy, and the Rosetta Stone was their reward. Not only does the decree allow the priests to remain in Memphis rather than coming to Alexandria, it also gives them a number of very attractive tax breaks. Of course, no teenager is likely to have thought this up. Somebody behind the throne was clearly thinking strategically on the boy's behalf, and more importantly, on the dynasty's behalf. So the stone is simultaneously an expression of power and of compromise, although to read the whole content is about as thrilling as reading a new EU treaty written simultaneously in several languages. The content is bureaucratic, priestly and dry, but that, of course, is not the point. What matters about the Rosetta Stone is not what it says, but that it says it three times and in three different languages. In classical Greek, the language of the Greek rulers and the state administration, and then in two forms of ancient Egyptian, the everyday writing of the people known as demotic and the priestly hieroglyphics, which had for centuries baffled Europeans. It was the Rosetta Stone that changed all that. And while the text of the stone itself is pretty unexciting, it dramatically opened up the entire world of ancient Egypt.